Let's start. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's start. Um, I would like to explain a little bit uh, that in order to give you a concrete uh, image of the intertwiner. So if you take uh, uh, SLN, which is what we're going to work with now, then you have uh, it acts on V, which is C to the N. That's a standard representation. And uh, you have uh, V to the power, uh, exterior power K. These are K forms. For instance, for physicists, if you take uh, uh, C4, uh, if you take R4, you know, the four-dimensional space-time, to the wedge power two that that is that describes the electromagnetic tensor, right? So and in that case you have a v to the tensor k tensor. So if k plus l plus m equals uh, n, then you have this. This one, the, the whole tensor product is bigger than V to than the wedge product. And, uh, and this one is a trivial representation one as a representation. So it means that if you uh, write the following, uh, this is uh, the identity of V to the wedge K. Then you have uh, the following K, L, M enter, uh, nothing goes out. Yes, so you have an intertwine of this form. This is a fundamental intertwiner. And you have also its uh, adjoint when you have K, L, M going uh, outside. So this is simply the, the linear conjugate of the previous one. And in this case, if you write the K primes, uh, that, that would correspond to a sum of this form, k prime plus l prime plus m prime is equal to 2n. So basically what you want is k plus l plus m is zero mod n. Now these are the basic intertwiners and uh, uh, you have uh, uh, some relations which normalizes, which normalize them, which I won't write. And then you have some very interesting quadratic relations. And I'm going to write the quadratic relation for SL3. Uh, the, for SL3, this, this was given by Greg Kupferberg. And in the general case, SLN, uh, most of the relations were given by Murakami. And uh, what you do is the following. You, you look at a blob like this, which has some uh, 
generators K, L, M, P, and you compute its dimension. Uh, this is fairly easy because you, you just tensor here K with L, uh, with M, with... Uh, so you, you take the homes from K tensor L, you know how to decompose K tensor L, you know how to decompose uh, 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 P tensor M, and uh, the number of homes will be uh, computable very easily then. I mean, if you have, uh, for instance, one copy of each, you just take the intersection of the copies. So if you write more intertwiners than, than they are here, then you have a linear relation. Yes, and for instance, uh, in the SL2 case, uh, I mean SL3 case, if you have this, so in the SL3 case, you can have this is, this is one. Yes, and by the way, this one is two. Yes, because two is a conjugate, V to the wedge two is a conjugate. Uh, and uh, these are called three and three bar by physicists. So if you have SL3, and if you take this uh, alternating, uh, this alternating picture, then you can uh, uh, find very easily that the dimension of this is two. So if you're going to write uh, three of them, they're going to be uh, linearly dependent, yes? And these three in this case are the following. This is, uh, this is one. Yes, remember, these are the nodes that we have. And you'll find after some normalization that this is exactly this. Plus this. So, Yes, all of these are intertwiners, so since only two of them can be linearly independent, the third one is a linear combination of the two. And uh, so this is uh, Greg Kuperberg. And using this, uh, okay, now one more ingredient that you have is an, uh, uh, is the following. If you take, uh, uh, something like this. This is the identity on uh, V to the wedge, V to the tensor power three, tensor V bar to the tensor V to the wedge two. Let's write it to the tensor power two. You see, so it's the identity really, this map. Yes, it goes from the top to the bottom. And uh, um, you can uh, take out of this the uh, irreducible component. Yes, so this is a projection onto the irreducible component, which irreducible component, this would be, uh, let's say here you have single dots and these are double dots, yes? So this is, this is a projection on a young, young diagram, right? Uh, this is just a symbol, it's a projection, but it's characterized by the fact that this is, uh, this is identity plus lower, so the identity has a coefficient one in it. And moreover, in representation theory, the highest uh, weight, I mean the, 
the, the thing that's used all the time in this course, we used it for the ribbon also, was that uh, when you have two uh, irreducible representations of a semi-simple E group, then the tensor product contains the highest weight one, plus some lower things, which you treat as perturbations. Yes? And uh, this is the highest weight one. So in particular, for instance, if you, if you put here a cap like this, Yes, do you see at the bottom, you have something on fewer wires, on only three wires, right? So this irreducible cannot, it does not exist on three wires, it's not generated by fewer things. So it means that when you put a cap like this, this gives you, this makes the, picture, the whole picture zero. Yes, there's no map from the irreducible to, uh, to a tensor product of fewer terms. Similarly, if you put here uh, two things, I mean an it, uh, something like our triple thing like this, this also makes fewer wires, yes? You see one fewer wires, and the representation cannot appear there. So again, this gives you zero, yes? So if you cap it like this, this gives you zero, this allows you to compute these intertwiners uh, by, I mean, this, these projections by induction. So these two properties, this and this, give you the projection. And then you take these projections and uh, you take three projections like this, let's say for SL, uh, first of all, for SL2, uh, with a, a bit of simplification here due to the, uh, I mean, we should take the oriented wires. So in the case of SL3, this one is well defined because you see the picture is invariant to rotation, right? Now, if you take SL2 only, this picture is a determinant of two columns as we did it. And remember, we had to specify one side or another. Yes, so the, uh, uh, some of these homes are not in, uh, changing sign with rotation. So, but uh, forgetting that, do you see that's a typical intertwiner for SL2? Uh, do you see you have here uh, five dots, and here three dots, and here four dots, and this is the intertwiner. Now, if you look very carefully who inter, who um, encodes this intertwiner, then you'll find that you can put here something of length one, three, and two. Do you see it's a graphical symbol which encodes the, uh, which tell you exactly what things do. Uh, so two of the generators move here, yes? Three move here, one is contracted. And you can really compute with this because you'll have uh, here a product, something like E1, which E1 tends to E1 tends E2, and E2 and E1 here, and something, and you know that E2 tends E1 uh, maps into the identity. So the uh, V wedge V uh, contains uh, the trivial, yes? And the trivial appears under E1 tends E2, minus E2 tends E1, yes? So if you have an E2 and a E1, they pair, and if not, uh, if you have an E1 tends E1, they give you zero, yes? And you can sum over the whole ba all the bases and you can work with this intertwiner. Now, uh, uh, here's what I had observed, uh, this is a picture that I sent to Arthur maybe 21 years ago with basically no explanation whatsoever. But, uh, uh, so this is something uh, for SL4 that you see there. Uh, do you see the, the curving uh, things are symmetrizers uh, on the three sides? 
So on the three sides, the, uh, the boundary are rectangles, as you can see, and they are symmetrizers. So again, the relations, uh, I mean, for SL3, one of my students cleaned them up uh, a bit. One of my former students, Livio Suchu, uh, well, the problem was very difficult. I think he was uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, scared of the uh, whole uh, thing it was. We were t trying to compute even the inner product between two such basis elements. And that was, that was not possible, so he went into finance. Uh, maybe that, that was probably not it, but uh, I'm just trying to make it. So do you see this is an inter, this is a symmetrizer, yes, for SL4. You see it has three blocks. And these are uh, what you see at every node are exactly these, yes, for KLM. So uh, using uh, these type of relations, little by little by little, one can, uh, one can uh, find, uh, one can separate these into regions. It's, uh, it uses a little bit of topology, one uses uh, the Euler counting for uh, and gons and edges and vertices and so, but uh, that's that's th th this was the one I had found and at this point I saw these regions, and I realized that the important thing were these honeycombs. Do you see there the honeycombs? Yes. So the the gray regions. Now in every region, in this case, if you choose some. Uh, uh, some uh, way of numbering things, then you'll have uh, the following. You see, if you, if you take the, uh, the simplex of edge four, then the natural coordinates for, for it are uh, four, zero, 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 four, zero, and zero, zero, four. And here you'd have uh, something like, uh, let's see, in this point you'd have zero four zero, but toward the center, which is uh, a one to one. Yes, and here you'd have, uh, at this point you'd have a, uh, a one one two, and at this point a uh, uh, two, one, one, yes, and so on. So this is zero, four, zero. This would be uh, one, three, zero, two, two, zero, and so on. So now note here these, uh, these numbers, two, one, 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 two, one, and one, one, two, yes? These coordinates, they're exactly uh, the, the numbers that you find at the nodes in a region. Yes, so the nodes separate into regions, as you can see. Uh, these are small permutohedra, and they are centered uh, around the weights, the weights of uh, SL3. So this has not actually, for some strange reason, has never been uh, noticed, although uh, these intertwiners are in use for a very long time, namely that the space of intertwiners of usual representations lives on the weights and roots of SL3. Yes, so this is math of SL2 here, yes. So these, uh, the, the representations here are naturally uh, in, uh, among the weights of SL2. Do you see on this line, you're on the weights of SL2, yes? And the interaction takes place around the weights of SL3. The idea is that if you take, uh, uh, if you take the roots of, oh, and the gray lines, the gray lines are, um, are weights, do you see? The gray lines are weights. This here is a weight of SL3. 
the point, the triple point. Yes? And the perpendicular to these, these lines, are roots. So, so you have a triple thing, you have the roots, roots of SL3, by that I mean now the root lattice, today just to keep uh, the wording a bit simple, and inside these you have the weight lattice, which is... Uh, which is the Voronoi neighborhood, in this case, of, uh, of uh, SL of the roots. So these are roots of SL3. So this is a root lattice, these are weights, and and around, now, if you do again the Voronoi neighborhood, Voronoi neighborhood means you take two people and you take, you divide for, uh, into, you, you, you take for each region. So you have a couple of points and you take for every other point, uh, you attach it to the point which is closest to it. Yes, so for instance, things here would be closer to me, and then they would be closer to uh, William, and then to Arthur, and so on. So you, this is a Voronoi neighborhood. It's one of the great concepts in, uh, uh, in geometry, simplicial geometry. And so these are the weights now, the vertices are the weights, and if you take the Voronoi neighborhood of weights, you see, you'll get, uh, remember that the roots are also weights. So then you'll get, uh, uh, you'll get this, uh, the permutohedra. So this is a triple thing. The Voronoi neighborhood of roots are weights, are the weight solid. The Voronoi neighborhood, and uh, and you see there in gray the weight solid, yes? And, uh, and the Voronoi neighborhood of that are these little uh, permitohedra. So uh, this shows you that an intertwiner, this displays an intertwiner as a computation machine, in a way. Do you see what you see here? is that you put vectors on the side, and you can put here EIs, uh, vectors in the usual basis of uh, wedge products, yes? You put them here, and at every node, you compute a determinant. Yes, so if you have a V1, for instance, uh, so if you take, uh, if you have three entrances, so if you have three vectors which go in, Yes, then you compute a determinant. You see, this is a determinant here. Yes, so if you have E1, where G2, where G3, for instance, that will give you plus one, yes? The other way. Now, if you put two entrances only, then the thing that goes out is a Hodge dual of the wedge, yes? So, uh, like that, you can, all this is a very massive computation. And this is what an intertwiner looks like. So, one can show by counting, in this case, I don't have a better proof, that the number of, so uh, apparently the honeycombs were known. These uh, were introduced with a different, uh, uh, non-graphical thing, but they were used afterwards graphically by Tau and so, but they were introduced by Berenstein and Zelewinski. Uh, a lot, several people other than I have also rediscovered them. But I re this part, though, has never appeared. What you see here is not in the literature. So this is a concrete intertwiner associated to a honeycomb. 
Yes. Now, when you do two-dimensional quantum field theory, you fill the space exactly with these kind of intertwiners. Yes. And what we want is to produce some higher method of uh, computing things in a way. So, uh, you see, it means that the space itself computes continuously determinants. Yes, determinants, Hodge duals, and so on. That's, that's what the space does. And uh, mm, so now um, let me go to the uh, to the following. You see, remember that we discussed last time. Uh, Blades, first plates, but then more interestingly, blades. Blades were, uh, this was last week, blades were pieces of the affine paving by permutohedra. Yes, they work not only in the case AN, but much more generally. But in the case AN, you take permutohedra, do you see here a red point? Yes, this is a point in the affine paving. You see here balls fragments of these balls. So it's at the intersection of four balls. Yes, these four balls, by the way, uh, you take the affine. Uh, this is the graph A3 affine. So this is the affine point. And if you remove the points, if you remove any of the four points, you'll get a copy of A3. Yes, so you get this way a permitohedron. So four permitohedra come out of that. And uh, so this is a blade, yes? So in the plane, so this would be for this, yes? Here again, you remove any of these points and you get an A2. So this is A2 affine. And this give, gives you the blades that we discussed last week. Yes, something like that. And what we're going to do now is uh, show that this comes out of geometry. So this is a curvature part which was announced on the, on the cover of the course. Um, uh, so we have to, to view these blades as curvature. So these were the generators of the blades, if you remember, in the plane, yes? These four, four generators of the blades. These are degenerate blades. Yes? And uh, uh, the idea is to, uh, to do the following. We take some vectors now. These vectors should be, uh, uh, should be really uh, yes. Uh, these vectors Ah, oh, this is a point lift. So this will be the exact thing. We'll introduce that directly in the book, but I'll tell you. Uh, so what we want is to, to make some lift here. So to view out of this letter Y uh, should become bending. Yes, so an intertwine, uh, 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 this uh, permit or this a fine, permitohedral thing should become bending. You should have one unit of bending on each of the surfaces. There are here six surfaces. By the way, uh, recall how you make your uh, a fine A4. You put, try this, you put your, your, the thumbs at 90 degrees. Yes, and then you put the hands perpendicular to each other, yes? And then you have exactly the affine graph A4. Do you see these two are at 90 degrees? These two are at 90 degrees and the other angles are 120. Yes? And so that's what you have here. And the idea is that these are, these are uh, uh, some bending. In particular, this should give you a, a, a rooftop-like thing. You see something like this. 
so some planes which which give you uh, the bands uh, the bands on a rooftop and the way to do it is to uh, uh, so if you have a, a uh, uh, let's say a, a non degenerate plate uh, well let's say a degenerate plate one one uh, uh, two, 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 uh, three, three. Then you're taking uh, the vector. So you do something like a no renormalized uh, vial uh, vector rho, but a degenerate vial vector rho. So uh, a little generalization. Uh, so you take here zero, zero, one, 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 and two, two. Yes, you put the numbers in order. Uh, oh, this is uh, nuts. Uh, this is just, this should be uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five, and six, seven. This is in one of these, one of these degenerate things. So this one is one, two, three, one, two, three. Let's put it like this. And this one is uh, something like uh, one, two, and or with commas, let me put commas here, one, two, three. And this one with commas is one, something like one, two, and three. Yes. And this one is uh, something like uh, one and two, three. These are plates. And so if you have something like this, then you take this vector, which has here jumps of one, then you... Uh, uh, subtract average, and then you divide by the number of lumps, which is three here. Uh, so you, you average it to zero, and then, so that way you get a vector. And you're going to get a vector like this for every cyclic permutation. So you're going to get a vector like this, in each region, and then you take the uh, you use the inner product. So on each plate, which is a region like this, you take the minus the inner product between a point x and this. Uh, uh, vector rho of the region, which is, uh, which is a vector described here. So this gives you something which I call the potential of a blade. So it gives you something like zero in the center, it gives you a real number. Zero in the center, and uh, here it's linear, it's linear on each of the regions because it's an inner product and it matches in the space between the regions. Yes, so these vectors have this property. So what you get is exactly a rooftop. Yes, with three slopes this way, with this potential. So the next thing is to take, uh, add, add all these, and then make a, a, another construction which is new, it has never appeared in the literature, uh, which is a geode. So let me uh, show here the, uh, the geode. And I'll describe how it's, uh, how it's done. So this is the interactive geode. Let me describe a little bit what's done here. So uh, we're running it right now. Uh, this is, as you see here, there's a function coin, called point lift. Yes, is it visible or should I make it a bit bigger? Well, uh, I, I'm just describing it in words, just a sketch of what's being computed here. So there's a point lift. And uh, uh, then uh, the data in every dimension is, uh, 
uh, the shards. Remember that we had a table of the shards, yes? All the, all the possible shards. And uh, so these are the affine regions ordered. So these are shards, affine shards. Um, let me show you here one of them. Do you see that's a point half, 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 half? That's a blue point in the middle of an... Uh, of, uh, uh, that's a point here, yes? And this, the shard that you see there is uh, one of the fragments here in, in 3D. Is, they're described by the vertices. Okay, and after this, we can do the geode uh, two plus one dimension. What we do is, after we give the potential, uh, that's uh, the crucial part is the following. Once we have the potential, let me lift the blackboard. So once we have the lift here, so our original thing is, uh, our original uh, picture is in the root lattice. These are root, on the root lattice. And we, we have this lift, and from the lift, so this is a lift, and the lift is exactly that potential that we described before, yes? Uh, and uh, after that, we're going to take for every piece, we're going to take a, uh, to really lift it orthogonal to the respective uh, piece of space. And this is a crucial part. Uh, the lift is such that the vertical lift is equal to one, or let's say is the same for every point. So this means that if you lift something which is very tilted, then a fragment which is very tilted, it would be lifted very far, so that the vertical lift is one. Yes, that, that turned out to be the crucial thing, and this is, uh, this is exactly what you get. after, as, as you can see, after a bit of programming. So we'll do, oh, let's do the here, this one was not run. So let's do the uh, two plus one dimensional geode. And uh, look, this is exactly the root space. Now we, I have introduced some random, uh, some random, uh, uh, A bending thing, so I, I just introduced a number of, of blades. Okay, so you can see here the lift, yes? And uh, let's see if you uh, move any of these. You see here you can, you can lift one of them quite a lot up or down, yes? Okay. And the, um, I'll tell you what the big, the main theorem is and the sketch maybe of the proof. So now we're going to put, uh, to lift everything. And uh, let's erase the, uh, let's skip the base. And now we lift everything exactly, if you look very carefully, the vertical lift is the same. Yes, so as you can see here, this is shorter, this is longer, the vertical lift is one. Yes? You see exactly as I was describing here. So just the vertical component of the lift is the same. Look, if you look at it like this, you can see, right? And look amazingly what we get at the top is exactly the intertwiner, the, those gray uh, lines between the intertwiners, yes? 
So at the top of the geode, <laughs> what we get is, uh, I remember I found this around the new year, it, it made my year. Uh, in a way, I mean, I, this, uh, th when these expand, these give you exactly those frames, I was calling them, the frames between, uh, between the different uh, regions. Well, to speak uh, in the local language, we are in the physics department where they do a lot of uh, solid state physics. So you can think of the uh, intertwiners as having phases. Yes, like two to one, yes? And these phases match one the neighbor uh, just because the coordinates match. Uh, one of the coordinates matches. So the neighbor of two, to one, of two three, four is uh, one, four, four. And the four at the end remains the same. That, that gives you the matching between regions. And so these regions are, are filled with intertwiners. So you see here that uh, all that you saw before is exactly the curvature of, uh, of a piece of uh, the, the uh, shards, yes? And the main theorem, the main theorem is that linear combinations of co-dimension one blades are exactly the same as uh, functions Uh, from uh, functions from the uh, root span, so the span of roots to R, which are uh, continuous. And two, they are linear except on the special hyperplanes. X lower S is... Uh, is in is some number in Z. So the number two is the same as saying that they are linear on shards. So they can bend, as you can see here, they can bend on the blue lines. Yes, they are linear otherwise and they bend on the blue lines. And uh, you have, uh, so, so this, is, this, is, uh, this will be something that will be put in the book. It, uh, in this case, you see for this bending, if we magnify it, first you have the conservation relation. So the bend between two of these, the bend here, yes, is equal to the sum. So first of all, what, what do we have? We have a rooftop, so the rooftop-like function is uh, will be since we the function is continuous, the two functions coincide on the intersection. Yes, so there will be a bend in the normal in the direction normal to the intersection. Yes, so you see there is a bend in the direction normal to the intersection. Now, this band satisfies a conservation relation because if you take six uh, intersection of three hyperplanes, for instance, this band from here here can be written as the sum properly normalized of the bands uh, 
uh, of the band through one of the sides or the band through the second side. So what you get this way is that the number of, uh, uh, if you have a, a special hyperplane, then the number of edges which, uh, the multiplicity of edges on one side is equal to the multiplicity on the other side, which I was showing you was satisfied by, uh, last week was satisfied by these, by, the, by our blades. And then uh, what you show is that if, uh, if this, uh, these conservation relations are satisfied, then they are linear combination of generators. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the geode. And uh, one thing we can add is a border to it. You see we can put here also the border, and what is a border? The border is really one-dimensional. Here I thickened it a little bit. Do you see the border? Yes. And uh, the uh, border, do you see when you have a, a something like this, do you see three and two, you can have a segment which is bent. So here you have a bend, bend three, and here you have a band of two units. And when you go from here up, you see with the recipe that I was just uh, mentioning, when you read it from the top, you have here three and here two. And this is the Young diagram. So the Young diagrams are really bending a wire in a discrete way bending a wire made of segments. The band at every node is a number of uh, uh, single of copies of V to the wedge K. Yes? And so what you see there in the honeycomb is that uh, on the boundary, do you see, uh, I don't know exactly what's the unit, which this is probably something like two, do you see one, two, let's say this is a unit here. This is here uh, four, and this is two. So this is a young tableau with uh, uh, two single dots, uh, four double dots, and two triple dots. Yes, that's a young, uh, that's a young tableau that you have at the, on this side. So this is an irreducible representation of SL4. This is another one. I think it's probably 333 and another one at the top. And um, what you are trying to build is a, uh, uh, what you're trying to build is, uh, is, uh, uh, um, you're given the curvature of the borders of a triangle and you're trying to build curvatures inside which are integers, so they are integer, uh, the amount of bending at every point must be an integer, yes? Although one can in principle make, uh, make uh, very interesting uh, limits uh, yes, if they are reals, not integers. But they are integers, so you're trying to interpolate. You have the, the curvature of the boundary, and you're trying to put a convex curvature in the middle to interpolate. And the number of such convex curvatures, which are integer valued, so the condition here for the intertwiners is that each of these edges is, is non-negative. Yes? This edge is exactly the multiplicity of a, of a, uh, of a, a band. You know, it's just a, the multiplicity of a band on an, on an edge. So, and after that, so you see this curvature here, and remember that curvature of this type is interpreted in physics as gravity. 
Yes, so this curvature then is translated here into a honeycomb and uh, as uh, you saw, uh, uh, as you saw uh, here, it was translated in a, uh, uh, the honeycomb was in turn uh, translated into, into uh, a, uh, um, into a, was translated exactly into the uh, picture that I was showing you uh, the other, uh, I mean, at the very beginning. Yes. Uh, now, once we reduce this way the, uh, the intertwiners to curvature, so let me emphasize again that what you see there, uh, in physics typically, uh, uh, a computation of that form, an intertwiner, is interpreted as the uh, inner symmetry of matter, the interaction between, between uh, different uh, symmetries of uh, uh, the, the underlying symmetry of matter. So in a way, it's a matter itself. And as you can see with this model, this, the matter lives in the folds of the underlying, uh, of the underlying thing, of the underlying uh, space. Now, the nice part about uh, this is that uh, this works now in any number of dimensions. And uh, again, this has not appeared before in the literature. My feeling is that what they did not observe are the shards, the fact that, uh, that in the middle of every octahedron here, you have to have an extra point. You see, that's the intersection of these special hyperplanes. Now, on uh, Wednesday, we're going to see that these special hyperplanes, in turn, come out of the higher SL2. So this is supposed to be a, a substitute for Gelfand-Sete. Now, here we have the same in one dimension higher. Now, in order to see the bending, I'm going to bend this to, to take put the camera, you see when you look at my hand, if you look at it like this, you don't see the bend, yes? If you look at it on the edge, you see the bend. You don't see very well the hand, but you see the bend. That's what we're going to do. And we, uh, we are going to, uh, to put here a bend using the formula that I was uh, showing you before. You see we bend it. And then we let's uh, bend it like this and then we lift it. And again the lift is exactly such that the vertical lift is what is the same for every maybe we lifted it a bit too much here we'll so you see you have here a mixture between uh, the uh, original picture which is at the bottom and the curvature and uh, now we're going to uh, put it back into rotate it back so we can see it from the top And uh, uh, let's remove the part with the curvature which is inside. And what you get is this, which is a, uh, it's a honeycomb in one dimension higher. Yes, this is, the honeycomb is on the geometry of SL4. Yes, and each face, if you notice this face here, on the side, each face is exactly uh, uh, the, previous, uh, uh, the previous picture for SL3, yes? So what you have is an interaction between, uh, between various uh, uh, copies of SL3. Let me see here uh, just a bit. In, in this, we, we have a honeycomb. And uh, 
I want to show you just the, uh, uh, at some point I made this into a uh, movie, the way it's, uh, where there are all kinds of honeycombs here, and there's even a, a British pop group, the Honeycombs, William, you may have heard, no, you never heard of them. Ah, they, they were quite good. And, uh, but here's a movie. Oh. So, as you can see, here's the original simplex exactly like there, and it separates into pieces. Now you can see on every face, you have exactly a, uh, the three-dimensional picture I was showing you. Yes, so these are then interactions between the interactors, yes? So this is what this higher representation studies, really. It studies in the first step interactions, then interactions between interactors, and so on. So, uh, and you can see here exactly how each vertex, uh, which remember last time we called a gem, yes, each of these vertices, uh, the blue vertex here, the half, 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 half expands in a box, and the other expand, the others expand in a, in an interesting solid which existed as a puzzle, but that solid has not appeared in the mathematics literature either. So this is, once again, as you can see, this is exactly the SL4 root lattice with the extra special, with the special hyperplanes, yes? And uh, all we need is some lift, which is not shown here. Uh, after that lift, if the figure is convex, then we... Uh, then we obtain exactly an interaction between, between uh, uh, usual interactors. As you can see, these match perfectly, uh, any of these match perfectly the, the thing uh, behind, yes? So uh, that would be the model that we have in mind. There's still a lot to compute, but the model would be that, uh, that uh, First of all, you, you have the bands, although these are somewhat discrete, but you have the bands of uh, space-time. And remember, this is just called dimension one. So uh, I have uh, only some hints of uh, what the interpretation for higher co-dimensions is. Uh, in general, uh, just a lift is not enough to produce arbitrary uh, manifolds. This is known, so these are somewhat special, but you have the others, the others which are studied in uh, this kind of model, maybe I'll discuss it next time. Um, this, the others are, uh, are uh, um, something like wedge products of the picture here. And here you can stop by on your way out. Uh, here what you can see is uh, four, uh, affine regions, yes, exactly a blade. Do you see the four affine roots in yellow? Yes, these are the four affine roots that I was uh, recommending you to make like this. These are in yellow, yes, and they are pushed away. So each of these four regions is pushed away. Yes, so I like to call it the dinosaur egg. It's like a dinosaur egg that, that breaks. And you see what emerges in the middle is, a, uh, is exactly a weight a fine region, a weight alcove, yes? Do you see these are exactly the weights of SL4? Yes, in red and magenta. So there are two long weights, and uh, so this is a group Z mod four, and so, so, uh, so this is one piece of curvature, and it produced, as you can see, it, it, it expanded, it broke the egg in all directions, so the one edge, for instance, the yellow edge became this triangle, yes? And so, so this is a normal 
push. And in this uh, little dinosaur that appears in the middle, yes, in this piece, that one is full of, as you have seen, uh, of what? Of computations, yes? So that one would compute lots and lots of determinants. And with some uh, uh, luck, this would be, uh, uh, this would describe in some way what we are made of. So we are made of computations, and uh, so it would be one dimension higher than this. And uh, I certainly have, uh, I mean, this honeycomb works in any number of uh, dimensions. It's a computer which is a bit slow, so I won't show you now a four-dimensional uh, a four-dimensional uh, uh, honeycomb, but I just want to reassure you that, uh, that the geode works in four plus one dimensions uh, as well. As you can see here, there's no problem, and it does produce. And uh, look here what, for instance, this is a part that we have uh, skipped. Ah, there. So maybe this is a better computer, which was, uh, which is new. So this is the flat part, as you can see. This is just a two by two simplex, but it's, it's kind of flattened quite a bit. And, uh, and you can uh, lift it. You can lift it here. So yes, it does lift and you can bend it. Ah, here it did bend, yes. And, uh, and so this, what you see at the top, is a projection. You see, it does look like a nice gem. Yes, is a projection of a, a four-dimensional honeycomb. Yes, so we are here in five dimensions. And this is, a, everything is projected onto one. But uh, something like this, actually, uh, with this you could, you, you could uh, visualize uh, all the computations in the Gelfand settling. So, so those are visualizable. And uh, I would like to make a model of this. This one exploded exactly into the 3D honeycomb. Yes, so it would be a couple of hundred dollars, well, my million. I don't know, something but a, a nice big model which would be, which would carry a lot of data. So I'd like to stop here. Sorry for.